before. Good morning. Good afternoon. I'm recording it in the morning. And we're going to talk about IT-based risk or managing risk. And really, this is where the book shows it's a little bit dated. Uh, we're talking about cybersecurity for the most part here. And back then, they might have been calling it risk. Now, I would think we just call it cybersecurity. Um, historically, it was low key. And we were talking about delivering projects and keeping applications up and running. Today, it's become much more broader and complex. You know, I think the risk of, uh, of an ERP system or implementation back in the early days was, is your business going to stumble? Are you not going to do it right? Are you going to have problems just running your business after you implement it because you implemented it so badly? Today, it's like, you know, is your information safe? Is Are your company secrets and personnel records and everything, is it, is it safe? So, you know, you can harm can be done within a company. There can be things such as, uh, you know, basically ransomware, where, you know, a, a hacker... A criminal hacker will get inside your system and basically code all of your data and make it unusable. And some of these codes that people use now, both for good and bad, are really hard to break because they involve very, very large prime numbers. And if you don't know them, you can't, that's the key to the code, you can't unlock it. And it'll take you forever to figure it out, I guess. So, they will charge you based on the size of your company, you know, anywhere from thousands to hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin. And uh, if you pay the ransom, they'll unlock your data. Now, many companies back up their data and can go back to another point, but it just depends how bad the encryption is and how bad your backup is. <clears throat> so the harm comes from within and without the company. If you get bad publicity, uh, or your reputation is tarnished, and it could, of course, hamper your ability to compete in the open market. So if we look at the external risks, they're looking at legal and regulatory hazards and third parties. And if you look at internal risks, you have your operations, your information management, and your systems development. I mean, you don't need to have your information hacked if you don't keep it up to date. It hacked itself. It made itself unusable. And then, of course, you have the governance of your system, the people, the processes, the culture, and controls. Risk oftentimes is about the process, about the controls, about the information, and how you manage all of that on the inside. Once your system, I think we've gotten system development down to the point where it's pretty hard at a large company, at least, to have a failed implementation anymore or to have the system decay to a certain point where it's not useful. Then, of course, it's how you use it, the operations. But the real risks are third parties from the outside, I would think, managing your own information and having the proper internal controls. Well, if we talk about external risks, we're talking about partners, software vendors, service providers, suppliers, customers, hackers, let's put that. Uh, hazards are disasters, pandemics, geopolitical upheavals, um, and legal and regulatory issues, failure to adhere to laws and regulations. And dutifully, your system will keep fine records of what you did and didn't do. So as uh, an inquiry is made by uh, a government office based on your inability to adhere to a regulation, they can verify it pretty quickly. Uh, when we talk about disasters, pandemics, geopolitical upheavals, is your system safe? Can you continue business? One of the things is if... Um, business is so dependent on information, information technology, 
you want to have it up and running at all times. So if something happens, if there's a hurricane, an earthquake, a pandemic, wow, they predicted what we're going through right now. Will, your, will you be able to still operate and function? Uh, geopolitical upheavals, uh, if there's a cut in electricity uh, due to a hurricane or a geopolitical upheaval, will you be able to maintain the integrity of your system and will it be able to run? And third parties, you want to know what they're doing if they're your partners and you certainly want to block them from doing anything if they have nefarious purposes. So if we talk about internal risks, uh, you want privacy, quality, accuracy, information. A university does not want all students to have access to all grades. Everybody would have a 4.0 average. Now, people risks. Poorly designed business processes, failure to adapt the business process. We talked about that already a little bit, and we'll talk about it more uh, in another lecture, that it, if you don't have your best practice or world-class business process, you will dutifully automate the transaction set that is suboptimal. Cultural risks, a risk aversion or lack of risk awareness. If you think, well, you know, I guess that's a cultural risk. Uh, nothing will happen. I'm eternally optimistic. We're an eternally optimistic company and people. Uh, we don't have to worry about being hacked. Uh, control. If you have ineffective controls, uh, your system becomes a sieve and then susceptible to hackers. Uh, many times when in my uh, quantitative methods class, we use a um, Excel add-on that basically provides algorithms to solve some of the problems and it's called quantitative methods or QM. It's just a software program. It's kind of nice. It's nothing special. But uh, a lot of times when people use their work laptops for school, they're prohibited from adding any applications or software. And oftentimes people have to use a, 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 a private their own laptop rather than a work laptop because the controls are have gotten so tight that everything is locked. You know, you're locked into only what the company has provided you software-wise. You can't download and run other software for the most part. And governance. Do you have the right governance? Are you paying attention? You've got everybody running around with a laptop, possibly a cell phone, that is a portal into your systems. And how do you govern all that? How do you keep control of it? Governance and control, I think they look at it separate. There's a tremendous overlap. So criminal risk comes from viruses, hackers, organized crime, industrial spies, terrorists. I haven't seen too much terrorism um, hacking, but we've seen industrial spying, sure. And you wouldn't even know if they've industrially, uh, if you've been hacked by an industrial spy because they don't want to leave a trace. Organized crime, I think most of the hackers that are stealing information and selling it are kind of organized. The ransomware are kind of organized. And it's always a battle to find out what their latest gambits are and what your latest defenses are. And there's an entire industry has been built up about this. So if you're looking at risk, you want to focus on what's important. You can't anticipate, I guess, all the risks, but attempting to reduce significant risk to a manageable level. That's a good thing to do, sure. Risk management is not saying no to risk, but saying how to say yes and thereby building a more agile enterprise. I don't know if it makes you more agile necessarily, if you're talking about, or makes you more a fortress, as in the case of the students with the work laptops. I look at it as, if we're talking cybersecurity, as I live in a neighborhood. It's a wealthy neighborhood, let's say, and everybody has nice things in their house and things that bad people might want to steal. I want to make my house a little bit harder to break into than the neighbor's house. If I succeed in that, a rational criminal is going to break into a house that's easier to break into. 
that's the same kind of principle you want to do. And you got to be uh, the problem with with the IT version of that is you it's it, the landscape is continually changing. You have to be on top of it. There we go. Expect changes over time. It's continuous. It's iterative and structured. A mandatory risk assessment should be implemented at different key stages. I think you have to have people that are thinking about it all the time and learning about it. So you have to have ongoing reviews. You have to evaluate your processes and what you need to change. You probably want to look at risk from certain, you know, different perspectives. If we go back to that original picture that we had, you want to consider all these, and you want to consider what are your biggest threats right now. If you know that internally you've pretty much got it under control, you're looking at third-party risks and hazard risks and those kinds of things. And I think that's where a lot of people are focused these days. So you want to monitor and adapt to new international standards and laws. You want to make sure that you're doing all the proper stress tests on your system to make sure that it's uh, able to do what it's supposed to do and will keep running. You want to have a drill where you fake, you know, you pretend like there's been a hurricane or a natural disaster and make sure that you can run. You want to do a check of your backup systems to make sure they're operating and, and reliable. And how often do you want to back it up? Do you want to back it up every month? Do you want to back it up every week, every day, every few hours? There's cost implications to that. But it's like insurance. Do you, are you willing to pay $2,000 a year to insure your car or cars? Well, if you have an accident, it could cost you a lot more. So what's the risk of having an accident? two, three percent, and you're paying $2,000 to save uh, maybe $10,000 in repair, is that an acceptable risk to you? So the same principles apply here. So the goal of risk management is to assure the right risks are being addressed at the right levels and at costs that you can are willing to pay. So the risk management framework guides the development of risk policies and integrates appropriate risk standards and processes into existing practices. So this is not something that everybody's concerned with in the company at all times, but, and, and of course, like even your insurance people, every company, a larger company probably has some people that are just worried about liability insurance and product liability insurance and all of those kinds of things. And most workers in the company are unaware that it's even happening. I think the same thing kind of sort of applies here. Uh, you notice the theme that I see is uh, the things that apply to IT are parallel to things that companies are already doing. They just have to focus it on T, like the budgeting process, like risk management. Now here's a basic framework. So what's the category? What's the policies and standards? What's the risk type? Who owns it? What's the mitigation? What's the reporting and monitoring? So this is a general area of enterprise risk, criminal operations, third party. We outlined that in that same diagram earlier. Most of the time I think now people are talking about <coughs> outside criminal kinds of activities. That's the, the, seems to be the, the top of the list for risk management these days. So you want to have some general principles for guiding your risk decisions. What, what, what do we want to do? How do we want to approach this? We want to maintain our data. We want to maintain our, our system to be able to operate and our business to continue to, to function. It's probably a good place to start. Each risk should be identified and labeled with a generic name and definition. Well, I think we've probably standardized that to this point, and you could probably even go and get a consultant that will help you frame all this. Of course, they're going to frame it in a language they're familiar with. And who owns it? 
Well, oftentimes, if you're talking about outside risk, I think that's pretty much an IT thing. And if you're talking about criminal risk management, it's it's in, in hackers. That's that's pretty much an IT thing. But it's also the individual. You've got to provide training to to so people can recognize a um, a phishing email when they see it, so that they can make sure that on work computers they're not going to websites where. Things can be surreptitiously and nefariously downloaded into your system without you knowing it. But it's mostly IT. If you're talking governance and data management and keeping your data integrity internally together, while certainly there's an IT function to it, Finance gets really interested in both cases because finance wants the integrity of the company. to They want to protect their data. They want to make sure that the system, uh, the company can function at any given time. So data management becomes huge. And for some reason, finance people are really concerned about that as much as IT people. And then it goes down to the individual worker who is responsible for maintaining certain data sets. You know, if I'm an engineer, I'm not responsible for keeping my customer addresses up to date. That's really up to the salespeople and the distribution people. And I'm not responsible as an engineer or as the CFO to keep everybody's social security. Well, I probably would want that to happen. But I've got to make sure that everybody's marital status and and how we manage our benefits are, is up to date. I've got to make sure that all the addresses, names, terms, and conditions of all my suppliers are up to date. I've got to make sure that the bill of materials for all of my products, how they're palletized, how they're packaged, weights, dimensions, and if you have tens of thousands of products and you have bills of materials like seven layers of them, uh, seven iterations of them, you've got to keep it up to date to the latest one. And bills of materials can be com complicated. That's the recipe of what you're going to, what you need to build a hard drive or to build an automobile engine or whatever the case may be, a bicycle or uh, a cell phone. So there's a lot of work to be done in maintaining and because the system is only good as the data that drives it. So data management is a huge thing. I think people have that probably 10 years ago, 12 years ago, it became a huge issue. You put all this money into systems and data management suddenly became an issue because people weren't maintaining the data well. Most of the time, it follows a scenario something like this. You implement a new system, people look at it and say, this darn thing doesn't work. What they meant was, this darn thing doesn't work the way I was used to the old system working, therefore this system doesn't work. Well, when people believe the system doesn't work, they're less likely to do the tedious parts of the job, which are like make, making sure you maintain the data. If the system doesn't work, why should I update the data? The darn thing doesn't work anyway. Guess what? When you don't update the data, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that the darn thing doesn't work. And if you neglect it too long, you end up with a data cleansing that's almost akin to relaunching the entire system. And it could be very costly. So major risks can be owned by committees, they can be owned by uh, functions, they can, and to a certain extent, when I'm talking about data management, it has to be controlled by and, and the responsibility of the user base. Risk mitigation. Okay, so now that we've, we know what the risks are, what actions are we taking to mitigate those risks? And what are the costs of those actions? So really, the level that you want to mitigate it 
is predicated a little bit on how much it costs. You don't want to spend, you know, it might be easier if insurance gets too much, health insurance gets too much, companies self-insure. They don't need a health care system. I'll, I'll put some money aside, I'll put it into a fund, and I'll use the same um, health databases that you do to figure out how much I think I'm going to be paying for major surgeries, et cetera, et cetera. And I can self-assure. I think Amazon does that. To the point where Amazon is about to become a life a health insurance company. Crazy. But that's what Amazon does. So how much is it going to cost to and what level of mitigation can we afford or are willing to pay for? Uh, reporting and monitoring. Well, it's no use to mitigate it, no use to do all these other things if someone is not going to pay attention to it and ensure that whatever you're planning is done properly and that it's effective. You'd like to know how many times your system was infiltrated. If you're talking about cybersecurity, how many times was it attempted? It's almost like each attempt is an opportunity to deflect it. Every intrusion is a defect. What's your defect rate for the number of times? So you, you have intrusions divided by the number of attempts. You want that number to be as low as possible. It's a key performance indicator, a perfect one for this, and you want to drive it down. I would imagine after a while, if hackers are realizing they're unsuccessful at your company, even your incident rates, uh, your attempts to hack into your system should go down. That's what I say, but I'm not an expert in that. So actions to improve risk management. You want to look beyond the technical risk, uh, develop a common language because guess what? Uh, and and uh, simplify the presentations and uh, I guess you want to right size the number of people that are looking at it and the number of people that are susceptible. It's an ongoing process. You can't relax in this part of the business from what I'm understanding and what people are telling me. Uh, one of the things you want to standardize the technology base. Most companies do that, especially when it comes to the to the laptop and hard, uh, software that is allowed onto your laptops. Uh, you want to have some rehearsals. You want to maybe even hire uh, consultants to try to hack into your system. You want to uh, make sure the roles and responsibilities in this regard are clear. Uh, even North Park has had some trouble with phishing emails and have had um, training videos that we've all had to watch and adhere to. And if I get an email that I'm suspicious of, there's a button on Outlook now that I can say report this as a phishing. So if I see something that it was um, didn't seem right, and check the email address if it doesn't something doesn't not quite right about it. Check the email address. It could be from someone you know, but not their exact email address. It could say their name, but something's wrong. Hit the phishing thing. It, it, it never hurts. So it's automate where appropriate. When you can do that, that's obviously the best thing to have some sort of automated controls and protections. But when it's really comes down to people, and, and this is what happens in phishing emails, you want people to be educated. And that requires constant communication. So IT risk is involved in many types of business and therefore should be managed well over time and how that ma is managed evolves. And you probably want to have an integrated risk management framework. I think if we look at the integrated risk management framework from 12 years ago, uh, probably good implementations and data management were probably higher on the list. And now cybersecurity has probably passed those up as we've probably gotten a better handle on those. Well, thank you very much.
and we'll talk again.